I have all kinds of stories of residents trying to manipulate my caregivers. If one of them won't give them all their sweets, they'll go to the next one. They're just dying to get sweets. And what, what always cracks me up is I see one of the hardest things is to get families to stop bringing sweets in. You know, they think they're making mom happy by bringing her some ice cream or some candy bars or something like that. I try to tell them, don't do that. But when I suggest a carnivore diet, they go, we should probably run that by a doctor and make sure it's okay. And I'm like, really? They've (laughs) eaten meat all their life, but now it's a problem. But the sweets are totally fine. We don't need to run that by anyone. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Today we have a special guest. Uh, Hal is here. Well, good morning. Welcome. Thank you for doing this. And so it's, I can't remember, and you're in Arizona, so is it, uh, I can't remember what time zone because you don't flip. Are you I on? don't change. So I'm mountain half the year and Pacific half the year. So what are you on mountain. right now? Are you guys on mountain or are you on Pacific? We're on mountain, so it's 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Okay, well, thank you for doing this. And for those that don't know, well, I'll let you introduce yourself. But I saw you on some tw- Twitter talking about, you are, uh, you know, have some uh, several nursing homes, and you're using a carnivore diet on 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 some of the some of the residents there with some really, you know, not surprising to me, but probably pretty interesting results. So, uh, tell me a little bit about your background, Hal. How did you get into nursing homes, and and what what made you decide to start feeding these folks a, a diet that most nursing homes sure as heck don't do? What's going on with that? All right. Well, it's a long story. How sure. I got into well, we got time. Homes. We got time. So, <laughs> all right. Um, I. I started my life as an Air Force pilot, and I went to the airlines and lost my job at the airlines with U.S. Air after 9-11, when half the pilots in the country got laid off. Um, Went into manufacturing because there were no flying jobs around. Uh, Did that while flipping some houses, doing some rental properties on the side, and I had an investor friend of mine say, Hey, you know, if you like rental properties, you should look into assisted living. It cash flows a whole lot better than rental properties. Um, and I was mostly doing rental properties to college kids at the university of Minnesota. And, and they said, and you won't have to worry about keg parties and doors getting kicked in and stuff like that. So I thought that sounds okay. So I took a course in assisted living. I was living in Minnesota at the time and liked what I saw. And my wife and I were trying to get to Arizona. I went to flight school at an old Air Force base here a long time ago. Uh, We loved Arizona, wanted to get back. My kids were going to ASU. And so after the course, I met a realtor who specialized in assisted living homes. And he had a a great deal on a package of them. So we took the plunge, moved down to Arizona. And I kind of got into it as an investor. but. A, it's a lot harder than rental properties. It's a business. It's not a landlord kind of thing. But I became very passionate about it. And and one thing I saw when I got into this business was that it it almost seemed a lot of places were a warehouse for old people Mm -hmm. waiting to die. I hate to say it that way. It should be more tactful. But that's what it seemed like to me. Put them in front of the TV and collect money until they pass away. A lot of these people are on 25, 30 medications, and those medications, A, seem like they were just to keep them quiet so they were not much hassle, and B, it, it seemed like those medications just numb the pain rather than actually make people better. And so I just said, there's got to be a better way. I've I've been a kind of health enthusiast my whole life, but I never really thought of nutrition. I always thought, well, if I work out hard enough, I can beat a bad diet. I found that's not true, especially I'm 55 now, and it's mm-hmm. that's definitely not true at my age. So I started looking into how can I make my assisted living residents better. And this, I, I've been in this about seven years now. At first, I just said, hey, let's just feed them better. There's always the joke about hospital food. Well, they were doing the same thing in assisted living homes. It was much more of let's really concentrate on what pharmaceuticals we're giving them versus what can we do to improve their lifestyles. So I I started reading books about Alzheimer's and dementia and um, senior health and things like that. I I started just talking to people finding people on the internet. 
unfortunately, I didn't find you, Sean, for a long time. But, you know, I started realizing people are getting better. There are lots of different ways people are getting better. So we just tried, well, let's not feed them sugar. Let's stop the desserts or let's give them fruit for dessert or something. And we started seeing some improvement doing that. Um, I talked, I went through a whole bunch of doctors to discuss and some functional medicine guys and things like that to discuss how can we pull back on some of these medicines? What, what benchmarks do we have to get to to do that? We had some success removing some because what I found in a lot of assisted living environments is they always add medications. They don't take them away. That's why we get to 25 or 30 at a time. They, um, every, every time someone has a new complaint, okay, well, let's give them a new medication. It's not like, well, maybe one of these medications <laughs> is causing it. Mm. So, um, so I, I went through a bunch of doctors and found one willing to do that. Fast forward to kind of today. Also, there's a lot of struggle with families. They're like, my dad's 85. You know, he likes ice cream, leave him alone, let him have that. And, and we try to do that. I tell people, I don't want to force anything on you. It's your family. It's your father. It's your mother. We'll do what you want. But hey, it might be nice if we do this. And I try to sell it to them of, you know, even if we don't get them better. And I've actually sent six people home that got well enough. They no longer needed assisted living. I mean, and it's in seven years. It's not you know, a huge success rate, but it's a start. Um, but I tell them, even if we don't send them home, we get them well enough that they can go out to dinner with you, that they can go home for the weekend, that they can go home on a holiday, their birthday, whatever, that that it's not like they just have to see you in the room for an hour, you leave, and now they're back in their room wasting away. And And that seems to be starting to catch on that they like that. We actually had a guy, 98-year-old guy, go on a cruise for a week and we let them borrow one of our caregivers. She got a free cruise out of it and took care of him on the cruise. And that was fantastic to us. And, and he was thrilled out of his mind. So, and it, you know, his whole family went on the cruise with him and stuff like that. So even if we can't get them home, we can get them to enjoy a quality like and we've taken them. Arizona is a big spring training baseball place. So every spring training, we take them to baseball games um, there are actually a couple teams that play in the towns of our assisted living homes, so it makes it easy. We take them to movies. We took them to uh, see Top Gun. Brought, got them all aviator sunglasses. You know, I love that with my history too. But uh, we've taken them on boat trips around lakes in Arizona, and they start seeing, "Hey, I can still have a life," and that seems to motivate them. So I did go through a phase, and I, you know, I'm a recovering guy myself of hearing that a really plant-based whole food diet helps people with dementia and helps people with chronic inflammation and, and things like and cancer and things like that. So we, I hired some nutritionists that did that kind of stuff. And I had a full on rebellion. <laughs> no one wanted to go plant-based. So I kind of canceled that. I did it a little, I lost a lot of weight. My, my wife was like, you look like someone from Africa. And and I was working out every day, like with weights, trying to, well, I'm trying to bulk up. I'm eating a lot of vegetables and stuff, but it just, it wasn't working. I wasn't feeling good. Then I started looking into this carnivore thing and it, it made a lot of sense to me, especially I can sell this. People like to eat meat, things like that. So I sort of went down two paths of this and it's, this is only in the last six months or so. So it's, it's a start. And I'd love from this group to get a lot of advice and ideas and connections and anyone can help me out. I started with a guy who came into my home that was 450 pounds. Um, he just lost his wife before of 60 years marriage and he was pretty depressed. And so I said, well, you know, you need to spend time with your family. He had two wonderful sons and stuff like that. So we, I actually bought the carnivore book from Sean or from Amazon, but Sean's book. Uh, we looked through that. I went on the Renovere website, got like a health coach that was an older gentleman too. We had several sessions talking to him and he tried it a little. We got some weight down, but he was completely brokenhearted about losing his wife. And about a month later, 
he actually went to the hospital and passed away mm. and, and his son's convinced he died of a broken heart. The doctors didn't really say what it was. We were starting to get somewhere with him and then that happened and it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. How, how um, old was he? How, cause he, you said wife of 60 years, he would have been, he was, he was probably 80 and he's 40, 80, 89, 450 um, pounds at the time. Yeah. That's pretty mm-hmm. amazing. You don't often see people that morbid obese reach that, that age typically. All the right. Way. Oh, well, I, yeah. I was very surprised. Let me, let me, uh, before you go on, cause this, I, I, and I want you to, but I want to just a couple questions. So you said, uh, was it Luke Air Force Base you were, you were doing stuff at? No. So Luke is, uh, is a fighter training yeah, base. Yeah, I, I was Luke's there. Like, I was stationed there. I was, oh, I was ahead okay. of orthopedics. I was actually yeah. at Williams Air Force okay, Base, which it. is on the other side of town, which is a pilot training base. Got I it, flew C 130s in the Air I Force. See. I've been I've been on the back of one of those <laughs> okay. with, with the luggage with the cargo. Anyway, anyway it's so. a lot nicer up front. Let me let me ask you because this is something a lot of people when we think about nursing home we almost always think you know it's the the older folks the eighty and ninety year olds are in the nursing homes. But what right. what what makes up the population of a nursing home? Because many people don't think these a lot of these morbid obese people just they end up in nursing homes because they can't care for themselves anymore. So who do who what is what does your population look like in general? So most of them are, are elderly, like mm-hmm. you're saying, although th- that's what I'm trying to get into more of this to get them at a younger age, because there's there's a lot of pro- people that have nursing home problems at younger and younger ages. People are getting dementia in their 50s mm-hmm. and Alzheimer's. Yeah. People are getting Parkinson's in their early 60s. Um, there's a lot of diseases of old age are getting younger and younger, mm-hmm. it seems like. And, and obviously the better the earlier you catch them the better outcomes you're going to get we've had people we've had we had a girl who was in our nursing home that had was 38 we've had 40 year olds 50 year olds most of them are 70 and up Mm -hmm. Uh, we've had 100 year old people Um, the oldest i had was 105 Um, so it's a wide range it's more of the people who have issues than it is that the age will we'll get 60 year old people in there too. So there's a, things called skilled nursing facilities mm-hmm. that are sort of more hospital right. nursing homes where they'll get very old people, but they'll get younger people who are in very, very bad shape and need doctors and nurses kind of around the clock. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. I can remember sending patients to sniffs or skilled nursing facilities. And it was sometimes very hard to get them in. Sometimes they're always full and it was a challenge. You have people they are well, horrible, you know, after yeah. a horrible accident or something, they need around the clock, clock care still, but you know, they're not right. sick enough to be in the hospital, but yeah, you know, no, it's, it's, it's terrifying to think about it. People in their forties and fifties now developing dementia, which is just, I can't imagine it what is. it does to the rest of the family. Cause as you probably are very aware, it's a, it's a very time and costly thing to deal with i mean it's an it's not a it's it not a cheap diagnosis and it it, it really can devastate can you I, I can't imagine being 22 years old and my 50 year old father now has dementia and i've got to deal with that somehow what do you do when you're a kid like that i can imagine it's challenging what do you yes. you know when we this is interesting because my my grandmother was in a, was in a, it was in a, um, a nursing home after i think she was about 88 or 89 or something went in there and spent several about two or three years there and then finally passed away but she was demented she had alzheimer's disease and I can remember specifically prior to that, even maybe ten years prior to that, she was just all she wanted to do, and she was never a, she was never a witch. She was a, she was a small woman. All she wanted to do was eat cookies and cake and sweets all the time. That was all. And some people will say that oh, yeah. dementia is is a problem with brain energy, and you can't get enough energy, so you're you're constantly seeking sweet. Are you did you see that prior to with oh, with the dementia oh, patients? Yes. All they want to do is eat the dessert. I right? have. I mean, I, I joke with my caregivers that we're running a drug rehab, not really an assisted living home, because, I mean, I have all kinds of stories of residents trying to manipulate my caregivers. If one of them won't, you know, give them all their sweets, they'll go to the next one. They're just dying to get sweets. And what, what always cracks me up is I see one of the hardest things is to get families to stop bringing sweets in. You know, they think they're doing, you know, making mom happy by bringing her some ice cream or some candy bars or something like that. And I, I try to tell them don't do that. But when I suggest a carnivore diet, they go, well, we should, we should probably run that by a doctor and make sure it's okay. And I'm like, really? (laughs) They've eaten meat all their life, but now it's a problem, but the sweets are totally fine. We don't need to run that by anyone. (laughs) And it's not just nursing homes. I I go visit 
my residents when they go to the hospital and bring them flowers or just check on them and things like that when I can COVID kind of slowed that down. But I was in the hospital one time with a lady who was in very bad shape, close to the end of the life. And I, a nurse comes in and orders a lunch for her. And the lunch she orders is macaroni and cheese and chocolate. Mm. And I even said to the nurse, does that make sense that that's something you should feed this lady? And she's like, well, I'm just trying to make her happy. <laughs> like, wow, this is a big problem. <laughs> Yeah. What, you know, when you, I mean, obviously you mentioned this is a, this is a business and obviously with business, you, you're concerned about cost constraints. And so I think many of the institutions, they look at what's the cheapest food we can feed these people, you know, and right. that often is what, why they're being fed what they're fed. I think it happens, you know, quite frankly, pretty much everywhere at this point. But, you know, when you first started to say, Hey, I'm going to try this cardboard diet on people, how did that go? I mean, how did, how did you like, I mean, how, how did you approach well, folks and did you get a lot I'm, of resistance? I'm doing it sort of one folks at a time. Right. Got it. I've yeah. had people I've started on that backed off it. I've had, I think I've noticed, and you may be able to help me with this. Like one guy I started it on suddenly had to go to the bathroom a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's, he's got a lifetime of toxins that are kind of starting to get out of his body. But normally, like I'm on the carnivore thing and feel great. And I hardly use the toilet at all. I mean, number one, I use normally, but the, number two, I try to, when they, I basically look for people who are, I want to get better. I don't want to just sit here. The ones that say, you know, just leave me alone. I want to watch my TV. I don't even bring it up. But that there's there's two other there's two residents that I'm very excited about. One, um, I've contracted with an insurance company to take their bariatric residents, very overweight. And they gave me their first one in October. She came into us at 548 pounds. And I, I sat down with her, she was in a sniff and said, you follow my program to the letter or you stay here. I'm not, I don't want to bring you in if you just want to continue what you're doing because you can do that here, no problem at all. You're going to be a big burden on my caregivers. But if you really want to get better, I'll bring you in. And she, she agreed. I hired a nutritionist who is a big fan of John Jackish and the X3 program that you're familiar with, I mm -hmm. think, Sean. Mm -hmm. And he, he, I paid him to work with her and the insurance company is paying me. She came in October 5th. We've got her on a almost all carnivore diet. We've got some intermittent fasting and she has like high carb and low carb days. The high carb days aren't a lot of carbs, but just try to help her um, not, you know, have a huge radical change. But in, since October 5th, we weighed her December 15th. And she's gone from 548 pounds to 413 pounds. Yeah, that's amazing. That's 135 pounds lost. Yeah. Yeah. We're, I mean, I'm over the moon. She's like, she's having her boyfriend come in. And the great thing is she's starting to shower by herself. She's starting to cook by herself. It's working. And I am not only getting the sniff saying we've got more people to send you. This is amazing. But like my referral agents that bring me people you know, who are all <laughs> slightly overweight are all like, you got to tell me what you're doing. I want to do this. So it's, it's spreading. It's neat. The other resin I'm very excited about is I, uh, there's a, there's a protocol out there called the Bredesen protocol. Mm -hmm. I know you've mentioned it before mm -hmm. yeah, on your yeah. podcast, Sean. Yeah. yeah Dale Bredesen. Yeah. Uh, yep. Practically everyone who comes in, I talk to the family and say, can we try this? And 90 per plus percent of the family said, no, it just, Let's just deal with what they've got. I finally had a family say, yes, that sounds great. Let's do it. So we've been working on that since I think late October, they moved in. We contracted with the Apollo Health Group and I'm actually paying for some of it because I, it's an investment for me. Because to me, if, if it works, and I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, but it's a protocol to actually reverse dementia or Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lady who's got mild cognitive impairment. And she's on it. We've got, I, I'm working with another company. Like you start with the Apollo Health Group, the official Bredesen one, but they want you to work with a doctor or health coach certified in it from another company or on their own. 
to do sort of a long-term ongoing coaching program. So we work with a company called the Mind for All Seasons up in Idaho. We work, talk virtually and stuff. They gave us a big roadmap. There's a whole bunch of things you got to do. One of them, the Bredesen Protocol calls for a ketogenic flex 12-3 diet, which is basically a ketogenic diet with 12 hours of fasting every day to help keep the blood sugars down and not eat three hours prior to dinner. But Bredesen is very much into plant-based. They they even say they want meat as a condiment, not as the main course, mm -hmm. um, to have small amounts. And they recommend a gram of protein for every kilogram of body weight a day. Because the company I'm working with is much more open-minded. I said, this carnivore, you know, the idea is to have low carbs. The carnivore does that. And they said, they actually said there's a lot of research that says for older people, a lot of protein is really good. There, there's a condition called sarcopenia mm -hmm. that is basically your muscles wasting away as you get older. It starts affecting you in the, your 50s. I'm a victim of it probably, but the protein's going to help them maintain that muscle mass and maintain their metabolism. So we're, we're making advancements with her too. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see, you know, you could run the Bredesen protocol side by side with, you know, and you'd have to divide it different residents and, and maybe more of a carnivorous protocol on the other side and see what your results are. Because I mean, obviously I'm biased, but I suspect a carnivorous diet would, would be superior, but you know, again, I'm not an Alzheimer's researcher, but a lot of old people have issues with dentition and this can be a problem. You know, they don't have dentures, they had half, you know, half their teeth are gone a lot of times. So they have a hard time. Some people complain chewing. And so how do you, have you had run into that issue yet? And how do you propose to get around that if you do? We do. Um, so what we do is we grind up the meat and water and sort of make a stew mm -hmm. and, and we get them to eat it that way. Uh, we also feed them a bunch of fish, salmon. We do the the smash fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovies. Um, I forget, herring was one of them, and I forget what the other one was. But we mostly do uh, salmon. We do some oysters, things like that, that give a lot of protein, very low carb, lots of nutrients, and uh, easy to chew and, and eat. We get various reactions. A lot of them don't like the oysters, but they'll eat the salmon mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And, and just to real quick on the cost, yes, my meat is is more expensive, and I'm going through some meat brokers and finding some local places that'll sell it to me in bulk. But I look at it as every every month that I don't have a bed filled is three to five thousand dollars that I'm not taking in. And every month, every time I get a bed filled or 80% of the beds I fill come from referral agents who I have to pay them a month's worth of commission to fill that bed for me. So every month that my residents stay alive, I'm saving thousands of dollars. And the difference between that and maybe a couple hundred dollars in the food budget, you know, that's quite a return on investment. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and and let me ask you about, because, you know, you mentioned it, you know, in seven years, you've had six people go home. I mean, what, what do you, what do you have, what happens when, particularly when you're dealing with these morbid obese people, which the goal would probably be, the whole point would be to get them, get them out of the facility, get them out of assisted care, return them to normal life, supposedly. You know, if this, if this gal, you've got this down to 415 drops down to 250, or something or under 300 she certainly should be able to go home i mean there's a lot of people that are functioning you know not optimal but they're certainly not requiring assisted care at that weight so uh does that pro is that a problem for you because i mean a lot of people say you're putting yourself out of business by you know <laughs> i mean there's probably a never-ending supply unfortunately we have a never-ending supply of sick you know certainly old people i mean there's always going to be old people but i mean as far as these morbid obesity does that does that concern you at all or, is, or does it just make you feel better when you get them out of there so, so a couple of things on that. First of all, the demographics are very much in my favor. All the baby boomers are hitting the assisted living age, and that's going to go on for 20 years. So they, they call it the silver tsunami in our industry that's hit. hit. So there's going to be plenty of people. Secondly, I'm a huge believer in give the customer what they want. And practically everyone who comes into my assisted living home, I mean, I could have the most gorgeous homes on earth. And they say, I don't want to be here. I want to go home. And over time, they adjust and realize we're making all the reels and, you know, helping them bathe. And all of a sudden, it's really nice here. 
but they really want to live at home. I want to live at home the rest of my life. My parents have told me, don't ever think of sticking us in your homes. So to me, yes, I'm maybe going out of sending my customers away. However, to me, if I have a home that says you can stay here for six months and then go home, I'm going to have no end of business, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I mean, what is, I mean, just the landscape of assisted facility, living facilities, nursing homes, is it growing in scope? I mean, is it more and more of them growing? Is it a growing industry? I mean, we're getting more people that need this and particularly at younger ages. Yeah, I think definitely. And I, I think the younger ages, it might be a little harder sell unless they're really disabled or something because they're, their parents are going to want to take care of them. They're going to have more of a support network. But the industry is definitely growing. I mean, like I said, the baby boomers are all retiring, so it's getting bigger. But I think a lot of people are, a lot of people in this industry are big investors that own 100 bed facilities and things like that. Each of my facilities are only 10 beds. They're basically a residential home converted into an assisted living home. I guess the derogatory term is group home. But, you know, if you drove by them, you wouldn't even know they were a ho an assisted living business. They just think it's a home in a residential neighborhood. So a lot of those investors are just looking at ROI and they're looking at cranking in people, you know, having them stay low food budgets, whatever. I've seen homes that, you know, it's ramen and peanut butter, jelly, most meals. And, and it's just, it's sad, really, that I, I think there's this awful feeling of, once you're here, you're, this is the last place you're going to live for the rest of your life. You know, we're just going to make you comfortable. And, and that's what you see with hospice. You know, there's a big push to get people on hospice. And it, it's sad. We, we've had people come in on hospice, a lot of them, that we graduate them from hospice. We get them well enough that they don't no longer qualify for hospice. Now, eventually, they're probably going to go back on it, just age. But, you know, hospice to me is a challenge. And, and I see hospice as, you know, another growth industry. But to grow, you got to put it on. In hospice, it's, it's illegal to cure people. Like you can't try to make them better. You can only make them comfortable as they're, you know, have some terminal condition. In fact, hospices discourage you sending people to the hospital when they're in trouble because you have to take them off hospice to go to the hospital. So, okay, I can't do it through drugs, but no one cares what I feed them and that I can make them better. And I also hired a personal trainer that exercises with my residents five days a week. And we see a whole lot of gains with the combination of the diet and the exercise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, exercise is a huge, huge thing there. What about, you know, all the, all, you, like you said, these people are on 20, 25 medications, you know, and it, you know, like when I was in medical school, and I think, I think to some degree in my residency, we would go to visit some nursing homes from time to time. And they were these big giant industrial places and there's, you know, 200 residents and it was really depressing. I mean, it really was, it was just kind of, they were just, like you said, just, plonked in a chair in front of a TV and, you know, half the half of them are asleep or, you know, whatever, medicated, overly medicated. How do you, I mean, how do you get these people off meds? I mean, what is a plan? Do you have, I mean, do you get, I mean, because most of the, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, physicians don't like hanging out at nursing homes. I'm not, I, I don't think, I mean, and right. it, it, they're, they're probably don't want to be involved in taking people off medications. You know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Right. How, how do you, how no, do you absolutely. see that playing out? Yeah. In fact, like the one on the Bredesen protocol, one part of the Bredesen protocol is um, hormones. They check what your hormone levels are. And our lady who's on it has very low amounts of a hormone called pregnenolone. Mm -hmm. And so we want to get her <laughs> boosted up. And the, the doctor's like, I'm sorry, that's just not the standard of care. So we can't. So the trick is to find, but this doctor that we have is very open to reducing medications. One thing that was interesting is she's on a Alzheimer's medication called Momentine, and we reduced that gradually, and her memory actually improved, which is kind of scary. But um, the trick is to find a doctor who's willing to do it. They have all kinds of insurance requirements with doctors. Uh, they have these standards of care of the way to take care of people. And they have to follow those to make, you know, their insurance valid and malpractice and stuff. So you have to find a doctor who's willing to, hey, I've done the research. This isn't going to hurt them. Let's try it. It was interesting, even though the doctor and I had an argument about the hormones, 
she later went to my manager and said, when I'm old, I want to come to this home. So you take care of me because you guys fight for people. Good for you. Um, so that's, it's the trick is to finding those doctors that are willing to do that. Cause we can't give someone Tylenol without a doctor's prescription by state regulations. Yeah. Yeah. I know how, how, how much of a challenge, but, but no is, one yeah. gives a rat's butt of what I feed them. I could feed them M and M's three meals a day, every day. And as long as I post it as a menu, I'm, in compliant with state regulations Do, you know but i mean as far as state regulations go i know with federal regulations there's a you know we have the usda food not pyramid now pyramid. it's whatever plate or whatever they're calling it these days um are you beholden to that and if so i mean how do you say hey look this is a special diet for this situation how do you get around that the department of health in arizona and i don't know how it is in other states but they're very big into if they don't have regulations they turn to our policies and procedures every assisted living home has to have a policy and procedure manual. And in that you put how your philosophy on, on dieting. And we put, we work in conjunction with doctors on these, on people's diets. We just leave it at that. We don't have the food pyramid or anything like that. A lot of other places have the food pyramid and that's what they say they're doing. So when they come to inspect us, they say, okay, what did the doctor say? And we have the doctors that I've worked with say okay you know what do you want to do and we tell them and we show them some research and they're like okay most doctors really you know they want basics like they want them to have some fruits and veggies and cut down on sugar the standard kind of stuff but i say we want to do this i've got a nutritionist that says it's okay they're like okay but let's monitor them if there are any problems you know we'll change that and then i just get a note from the doctor i show it to the department of health and they're cool with it yeah, that's, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, like I said, as, as things go forward for you, I mean, if you're wanting to continue, you know, on a, on a more carnivorous approach, you know, as our company Rivero starts seeing patients here and probably this spring, I would imagine by the time we, you know, that's what I'm projecting uh, a lot of it's virtual. So that may be something you can, you can use as a resource to, to sort of I would love it. help that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's if you don't mind, I'd love to keep talking about sure, it. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be looking for patients. And so that would be a, that would be a win-win I think for both. And I think it's something that, um, I got 40 of them for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. And we've got, you know, like I said, we've got, we'll get some physicians in Arizona as well, licensed in Arizona. So what, um, okay. I, I noticed just one thing that's really a pet peeve of me. Someone brought up in the chat that just popped up ensure that is yeah. oh it drives me nuts how much that is pushed in the senior healthcare industry mm -hmm. and uh, let everyone know out of here that's like pure sugar milkshake yeah. Yeah. and you see, and they're like well you know he's wasting away let's get him some insurance it's got a lot of protein I'm like it's just going to make him waste away faster yeah that's so. that's that's complete garbage I, I you look you just turn the ingredients over and you just shake your head and anybody even consider drinking that and not, yeah. not only poisoning their their grandma with it or whatever you've got the one patient who, who you shared on twitter by the way and i retweeted that with the, the gal that lost 135 pounds which is amazing to think about 135 pounds in about two and a half months is a pretty significant i mean that's that's kind of amazing to see how much i mean is she surprised i mean what what, what was she is yeah. over the moon thrilled we were surprised i i was hoping for like maybe 50 pounds in two months or so the guy i'm working with is a guy named daniel magyar he's 295 pounds himself but it's like eight percent body fat kind of thing he said at first because she's so heavy that she was going to lose a lot of water weight mm -hmm. and my caregivers were calling me probably every day for the first three weeks she was there like oh my God, this girl pees a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and as we got her on that diet, it was like the water just flushed right out of her. And we saw a huge 60, 70 pounds right away kind of thing. And it's it's slowing down. But in the last two weeks, she lost 30 pounds. So I don't know all the metabolic processes of it, mm -hmm. but I think when they're that heavy, the weight loss comes a lot faster. And he mm -hmm. even said, you know, now we shoot for five or 10 pound losses each week. Yeah. That's um, still you know, that's still significant. <laughs> that's still yeah. a lot. Five pounds a week, ten pounds a week is pretty huge. Oh so, yeah. yeah, you do the math. That's you know fifty two weeks in a year at five pounds a week. You're two hundred and fifty pounds in yeah. a year. Yeah, no, that's that's and I think that's I think that's achievable. You know, for the first year, and then then obviously you slow down at some point. But uh, but we're really trying to get her to do as much independent 
stuff as she can. Yeah, I'm just wondering because you know, let, let's say you get, let's say she loses another hundred pounds and gets down to three hundred pounds, and then she's you know probably could go home. But technically, is there a way to keep her keep her longer? So, I mean, is there like some? It, I guess it's just a matter. Of, if somebody, and, and somebody's that's up to her. Yeah. All, right. I, all our contracts are 30 day notice kind of things. I, I don't hold them longer than that. I'm like, if you don't want to be here, I don't want to mm -hmm. keep you. And when you're ready to go out, you let me know. We, I bought her a laptop. She's taking some classes to work in the medical field. Mm -hmm. um, she's not sure what her role will be. We're going to try to get her a job and, and then hopefully uh, move her out. I told her, well, you might come back as a consultant here. Yeah, very, well, very, very possible. I mean, I, I can tell you a lot of the coaches that I have on our platform, many of them were, I mean, most of them were people themselves that, that went through all this stuff and figured it out and they've become, become huge advocates. Uh, and it's really neat. Is she on a bunch of meds? I mean, she, I made a 500 some pounds. Does she have any other comorbid conditions? Yeah. I can't imagine she didn't, but she's probably, she was probably on 17 or 18. We're trying to reduce those, but she was in a skilled nursing facility for, I think she said seven years and nine months wow. before she came to us. Wow. And they didn't do anything. They, I think in those seven years, she lost about 50 pounds. Yeah. She was up over 600. Wow. But, um, no. And and I talked to the director. I'm like, why don't we look at, because they've got a whole bunch of bariatric patients. I'm like, why don't you look at the diet? And he said, the diet, the food is totally dictated by our corporate office in Missouri or wherever it was. We just have to feed them that. And they have all these resident rights in that facility that most of the residents ordered DoorDash foods on top of the meals, the bad meals they get in the hospital. So he's like, I'm stuck. I can't do anything. That's why we like the idea of you going. Uh, I guess the Department of Health won't let them kick anyone out unless there's a financial reason. And and the insurance companies are all paying for that. Medicaid is. So they're not going to get it kicked out. So, I'm, so you're saying I'm paying for that. <laughs> so you're paying for yeah, that. I'm paying all, for all everyone that. Everyone's called yeah. paying for that. Yeah. But when they come to my house, my rules, according to the Department of Health, I can give them a 30 day notice for anything and kick them out. So I tell, you know, all the future ones, uh, I'm going to tell you follow the program or you come back here. And they're most of them are like, I'll follow the program. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, I think about it because some people just need that level of oversight and, you know, discipline, yeah. you know, that, that they don't have, they, they can't do it themselves. And I think it's wonderful. I, I often fantasize about having a, a giant sort of, I won't call it a prison colony, but a place where people are captive and you can control what they eat, you know, and regulate. Yes. Cause you, I mean, you would do, you can do dramatic changes when people are sort of like, this is what you get to eat and you're going to make do with it. But, uh, and it's not bad. I mean, are, is she complains, are they complaining about like, oh, I don't like this food or, I mean, cause most people like, I know my diet, I, you know. And not, I'm not not expecting that they're feeding ribeye steaks. When I go down and eat a ribeye steak, I'm like, it's pretty good. I don't mind it. I like it every day. So. <laughs> I love eating ribeyes now. She she has said, this is getting old. There's not a lot of variety. So we've tried to mix it up. We tried to make some stews. We I bought a bunch of uh, like barbecue spices and things like that. And that's helped a lot. And we, we've introduced more fish. We've introduced, the trainer does let her have a, some vegetables mm -hmm. like a, a cup full of brussels sprouts or broccoli or asparagus things like that and that's helped some too so i i can't say we're 100 percent carnivore with everyone mm -hmm. but or anyone but the bulk of it is and that's yeah. what's made it yeah and that's say you know putting high quality nutrition there and, and i always said if you just decrease the junk food and increase the meat you're going to see a big health gain and i think that's that, that holds up and you're showing that as an yeah. example, are you getting more and more, you mentioned you're starting to get more and more referrals, people like, you, you know, if you become a bariatric facility primarily, which, you know, this is, you know, cause you can't, you know, if somebody's 90, you're not going to turn them into a 60 year old. I mean, they're still 90. No, no, absolutely. But, but I mean, I think you, you have a huge potential to take these five, 600 pound morbid obese people and, and, and rehab them and get them back into life. That's, that's neat. Are you seeing, like I said, but I, 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 I certainly think, and you know, I, you know, Del Bredas and, you know, with his, his, uh, uh, protocol, but I think a carnivore diet would actually work quite well as well. Um, are you seeing some cognitive benefits in some of these older folks when you change their diet? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the lady we got on the Bredesen protocol, we think the primary problem with her is her mouth. She's got a lot of those teeth issues. We took her into the dentist to get what's called a cone beam scan, which is kind of a CT scan for your mouth and mm. teeth. She has infections all over her mouth. Mm. And 
the company I'm working with, Mind for All Seasons, is convinced when we get that fixed, you're going to see a dramatic improvement in her dementia. The trouble is what she needs is about twenty to $25,000 in work. So we're working through the insurance companies to figure out how we're going to get insurance to pay for most of that. But in the meantime, we put her on the carnivore or we we give her like eggs for breakfast and bacon. We give her meat for lunch and everything, very little dinner. And we try to do it at like 4.30 in the afternoon so she can fast till about eight the next morning. And my manager's like, holy cow, she remembered everyone's name in the house the other day. And she told me what we did yesterday. And, and for her, it was like Groundhog Day when she came in every, you know, Every day she'd be like, okay, today's the day I'm going home. And we're like, okay, great. And then at the end of the day, it's, oh, well, I guess they're not going to pick you up. Why don't you stay one more night? She's starting to remember like, hey, wait a minute. How long am I going to be here? I've been here like three months now. And what's interesting is when we had Thanksgiving, we had a, we had a big celebration of Thanksgiving, it, families coming in and everything. And then when we had a birthday party for someone and she ch- kind of cheated on both of those days and had a little of the dessert stuff like that. My manager said she couldn't remember where her room was. It, it's not like it fixes it. It's if you want, you don't cure dementia, you, you put it into remission kind of, yeah. but if you start cheating again, it comes back. And, and Dale Bredesen says that a lot, but the carnivore definitely seems to be working because we're waiting on the dental stuff. So in the meantime, we're doing the carnivore plus some vitamin stuff and it's it's making a difference yeah that's that's exciting to to see and i'm and i'm not surprised by that i've just seen anecdotally i've seen similar stuff happening and one of the things is you know it, it what it is it, it shows you how powerfully negative or almost poisonous some of these foods are when you see you eat eat a piece of birthday cake and all of a sudden you don't remember where your room is or something like that. It's kind of right. shows you the, the 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 power the food has particularly in somebody who's already got compromised physiology or illness Somebody's asking about, I mean, obviously morbid obesity, we see, see that, but are you seeing the opposite end of the spectrum? Are you seeing people that are emaciated, like cachectic and just wasting away, oh, yeah. like sarcopenic? And how do you, I mean, you know, again, I know that your sample size is not big yet. And, and this is something we'll probably see, you know, a couple of years from now, you'll probably have, be able to report on this. But are you seeing people regaining strength and putting on some, some lean mass? Yes. I, between the protein we're giving them, and the, the personal trainer we've had, we weigh them every week and we've definitely seen improvement. We do get, especially the ladies, older ladies come in looking like Ethiopians, mm-hmm. some of them. And we do see them weight gain and the family's thrilled when they see that. Also, we see when they gain some weight, a lot of times their mobility gets better. Mm-hmm. Like we've had people who are bed bound get into wheelchairs. We've had people who are in wheelchairs, start walking with a walker. We've had walk people with walkers be able to walk without the walkers. And and you can imagine the sons and daughters are absolutely thrilled seeing that kind of stuff. Let me ask you about the staff, because one of the problems is a lot of people just don't want to work in a nursing home because it's depressing and it's, you know, you're it's it's not fun work, you know, you know, changing bedpans and moving people around and you know, it's tough. And and are you seeing like a more energized or excited staff when they get to work with these people that are actually sort of winning, I guess, for a better lack of a better word. Are you seeing some, some, some people like staff excited about this stuff? Oh yeah, I I definitely do. I mean, that manager who's helping the dementia patient is like, Holy cow, this really works. Um, So, and that kind of feeds on itself. So she helps with the meals to try to keep her that way and, and start, moving those meals to other residents too. I've been very blessed. My staff, I consider my family. They Most of them have been with me the whole six or seven years I've been doing this. There's a lot of turnover in this industry for the reasons you cite. It's depressing and no one's getting better and things like that. But when they see it get better, they're very energetic. And I, I tell them because we have people getting better, because we can tell them these stories my rates are going up. And when my rates go up, the staff rates and pay goes up too. I'm like I said, they're part of my family. So they're going to share in this, you know, and then they get family phone calls of I'm thrilled with this rather than what are you doing to my mom? Why didn't she get this medication? They're more like, wow, I can't believe my mom today. It's wonderful. And it, it, it's just naturally makes them feel a whole lot better that they're 
they're hearing that rather than just the complaints. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I know like as a physician, once you start, when you go from just medicating people all the time and basically, you know, throwing drugs at symptoms to actually curing people, getting them better, it, it, it just changes your whole outlook. And, I, and the number of physicians that have done that now that I'm aware of, it's literally changed their entire career. And, and a lot of them, they want to get out of the standard medicine and go into pri their own practice because so they can do this. What about the other residents? I mean, the ones that are still mentally able to observe these things. Are they seeing the people around them that are on these protocols going, wait a minute, are you saying, hey, look at Sally, she's getting better. Would you like to try this? Is, are you being able to leverage some of the other patient success or resident success for, for some of the other folks? I, I do get some of that. It's a little limited. I hate to say it, but a lot of these residents are you know, they've been a lifetime smoker or lifetime sugar person. And they're like, that's nice. But you know, I really like my cake, or I really like, you know, I have some that still smoke and are in horrible shape. And I have to get a doctor's prescription for them to do it. But they're like, yeah, I like my cigarette. You know, they go outside and do their thing. So it very much depends on the individual. I mean, I, I think in general, there are people who want help, who want to get better, and there are people who are just fine with their condition and nothing I can do about it. Yeah, my dog is excited in the background here. But um, let me, so, I mean, I guess going forward, I mean, as you know, as you have more and more success, which I have no doubt that you will, um, you'll see... I mean, patients or, or clients or patients, whatever you want to call them, residents, they come to you for the express reason to actually get better. They actually want this. And that's, that's going to, that, and that that's exciting because, you know, as I do consultations, everybody that comes to me has already made the decision. They're like, hey, I'm interested in what you have to offer. Let's do this rather than being kind of convinced, right? So, right. It, it you know, like I said, you become this uh, sort of beacon in this because <laughs> you're in, you know, Arizona, obviously Phoenix, Arizona is that's the home of a lot of retired old people, right? There's a lot of folks. Heaven's there. waiting room, we call it. Yeah, Sun City and all that. I remember I lived in Surprise, and I know there was a lot of rich, lot, a lot of old folks in that area. So you've got this. I got uh, two homes in Surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a neat area. So, um, what? And just, I mean, I guess because maybe somebody watching this may he hear about it, you know, in Arizona because we got a lot of folks. What is the name of your facility? What? Where are your facilities? And how does somebody? How would somebody who's interested in actually? improving maybe their parents life or somebody who's you know they're one of their relatives that's got some med medical issue where, where would they go okay well first of all if you are that person i will invest with you i will bend over backwards to make your resident whatever that is mom dad whatever better i will do i want to team up with you and and make this so i can get to the point where i'm like you sean where they come having the decision that they want to get better originally my website is a paradiseforparents.com, the letter A, paradiseforparents.com. Um, there's a nice picture of Luke Air Force Base. We took our residents to the air show a couple of years back on the front of it. Mm. I've got two homes in Surprise, which is in the northwest corner of um, Phoenix, the Phoenix Valley. I've got one in Goodyear, which is about 15 minutes south of Surprise. And then I have one in Mesa. Uh, over on the east side of town. And the Mesa one's primarily the bariatric one for now. And then the good years where I had the Bredesen Protocol lady, but I can easily expand that to the, the surprise locations, kind of either one. If you're interested, I'd love for you to look me up. And even if you want to do it at home, I'd love to learn together with you. So uh, I'm extremely passionate about this and, and want to help in any way I can. Yeah, this is, like I said, I'm, I was excited to have you come on here, uh, Alice. This is, this is, I mean, this is, you know, like I said, I think this is something that's replicatable across the country. You know, we could get that where we could, you know, because these people, a lot of them needlessly suffer. And, you know, you can imagine how many, just, just from a financial standpoint, how many healthcare dollars that people, all these people that are sitting seven years in a sniff cost us. Um, right. You know, we could literally you know, reduce billions. half of that. Yeah. Billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, probably a year in, in overall healthcare costs. So thank you for being willing to do that. Um, are you getting anybody that's like fighting against you to do this? I mean, I know you said you could eat, you could feed them, you know, chocolate chip cookies all day and no one would say a word, but my God, you give them uh, you know, a steak and an egg and they're like, Oh my God, their <laughs> cholesterol and they're 90 years old. Like who cares at that point? <laughs> yeah. Right. But are you getting, are you getting any negative negativity directed your way? I do get some of that, but I, I give up on it very quickly. I don't, I don't try to fight them. I just accept it. I, I tell my 
residents, we're not a restaurant. We can't make 10 meals three times a day for everyone. We'll make some healthy stuff. If you want a little unhealthy thing added to it, so be it. Okay. But, and we'll take requests. And if you want the ice cream, we'll put that in a special fridge that we won't tell the other residents about. And we'll get it to you. But generally, I want people who want to get better. So I don't, I don't fight people. I just say, okay, that's your thing. But these people are going to get a lot better than you. Yeah. But outside of the residents, I mean, you're not like getting the state or some healthcare worker outside. Oh, no. Coming I, and saying, hey, you the can't. State com- the state comes in my homes and it's like, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. This is amazing. I, I had a family come to me one time doing a tour to see if they want to move their mom in. And my residents were all walking around and doing well. And they're like, wow, the last place we went to, we told them my mom's agitated and walks around a lot. And they said, well, we'll have to sedate her then. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I hope you ran out of the facility. I get very, the, the state, um, as long as I'm complying with everything, which I really try to do as much as I can, they are very into Hey, if you're making people better, we're not, we don't want to get in your way at all. Um, and I, and the nice thing is they have a, a sort of, they call it a surveyor of the day, the guys who come in and do the inspections. And you can call in any time and say, Hey, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this. Am I going to run afoul of any problems, regulations, compliance if I do that? And they, they'll let me know you can do that. You can't do that. And, and so the doctors, I do get pushed back from time to time. And I just say, well, let's have a discussion. And I don't want to violate anything on your side, but how can we work together? And sometimes the doctors will refer me to another doctor who is willing to do that and said, I don't want that responsibility, but I think Joe over here doesn't mind doing that. And then I'll get him to prescribe. So if I can get your network of doctors, Sean, mm-hmm. I would be thrilled because the state basically says, if, if the doctor says it's okay, we're okay with it. Awesome. On almost every. Day. Awesome. It's good to hear. Good to hear. Well, Hal, unfortunately, I'm running out of time. This has been wonderful. I'm sure we'll have more discussions down the road. Um, I love it. Thank you for, thank you for being here. But thank you for doing what you're doing because this is uh, this is how we, you know, collectively change change things because we've got some problems as you as you see very firsthand. So thank you very much um, for the rest of you guys. Uh, thank you. We'll be back tomorrow. Everybody, take care, Hal. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Bye, bye, guys.